Bună seara! Good evening! So, welcome to the second day of uh, Matsokyo Talks 9. Um, we have the honor of uh, welcoming to Bucharest Tony Freten and Jonathan Sergison. Yesterday, in Sala Frescelor, uh, Tony Freten uh, presented uh, a beautiful lecture, and today is uh, Jonathan Sergison here with us. Um, I would, uh, I would like to, uh, before beginning, I would like to, th to say thank you to the Order of Architects uh, from Romania that enables this uh, series of conferences uh, through the Timpru de Arhitectura, architectural stamp. Um, it's fantastic that uh, this mechanism exists and that uh, it is close to, to the School of Architecture, as here uh, we are uh, uh, many students and teachers uh, from Ion Mincu. Um, before uh, giving the, the microphone to Jonathan, um, I would like, well, not to present him, because uh, I'm sure everybody is familiar with uh, Sergis and Bates architects and with their work, also uh, with uh, um, his teaching, um, but uh, I thought that maybe uh, I could say a few words uh, as regard to the context uh, of uh, inviting him here. Um, and as we are among uh, ourselves, um, this feels right. So, um, first, uh, a more subjective uh, uh, story. So, I first I first discovered uh, uh, the work of uh, Sergius and Bates, I think, in the year 2000. So it's like 23, 24 years ago, when you know it was uh, when we when we were students, and it was the time of uh, the architecture that made the tour of the world uh, with uh, uh, architecture that was very focused on objects and on um, radical architecture and with manifesto architecture and. Uh, I remember I, uh, at a certain moment I had uh, a magazine, uh, I think it was a Spanish magazine that uh, I, I had in my hands, uh, dedicated to the theme of memory, and there, were, uh, there was uh, presented this um, beautiful project, The Houses of Stevenage, uh, which, I, if I remember right, it was built in 1998. Um, and maybe uh, you know this project, um, it's uh, with uh, these two twin houses, which is like a, like a, a drawing uh, made by a child and mirrored. Uh, it's a, 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 a black and a white house. Well, I'm not sure if the, the colors are right, but anyway, this is my memory. And I remember I was very, uh, this image, this photograph of their project uh, stuck very, very much with me. It was a very powerful image. Maybe uh, Jonathan will present it tonight, we'll see. Uh, if I remember right, there was also the family in front of the house and uh, I was, I remember I was very puzzled by this effect it, it had on me that architecture might be something more than just, uh, you know, the isolated object of architecture as we used at that moment anyway uh, inside our university to, to, to have and to discuss. So uh, somehow I, I felt more than uh, the rhetoric uh, discussion about, uh, about uh, the object of architecture and more about use and about uh, stories that unfold inside that house and about the neighborhood that, was, uh, that the house uh, came into, uh, into a, as a context. And the second uh, project um, uh, that stuck very much with me um, is a, a more recent project, Hampstead Mansion. Uh, and that is due to, to this fantastic um, uh, research and uh, discussion on the theme of the room, especially on the theme of the rooms. How I remember seeing for the first time the plan and uh, having a sense of, uh, you know, uh, trying to understand even more how, how is that possible to have such an architecture that is at the same time very rigorous and at the same time is so free in its unfolding of uh, all the spatial sequences inside the house. Um, and uh, for me, anyway, uh, that somehow triggered uh, 
the, the voice of Luis Khan that spoke about this society of rooms and uh, about this fact that architecture, at the, uh, it starts with this simple, simple fact, how a room uh, inhabited is. Um, yes, so in this context, uh, we as a group at Matokyo, we invited uh, 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 Jonathan Sergison tonight for this lecture. Um, in this, uh, as we wanted to, to, to have this uh, moment of discussion about architecture, um, an architecture that is somehow modest and quiet, in the same time powerful, and uh, that comes into, into the neighborhood, you know, with uh, just one building and somehow, somehow uh, resolves, if I may say, that neighborhood, that, uh, that context. So, um, not, not a spectacular for the sake of spect spectacular, but uh, it's, a, it's a, like a quiet architecture that resonates from inside towards the exterior. And um, a, f a, a last, a last uh, thing um, before I give the microphone to Jonathan, um, I would like to say that um, also Tony Fretton's presence here and uh, Jonathan Sergison's presence here um, somehow for us uh, is like uh, the underlining of an important model as architects who practice, who teach, who write, also who deliver conferences, and uh, I think that might be uh, another genre of architecture, as uh, speaking architecture is not the same as writing architecture. And uh, it's like, especially for the young students here and uh, young architects that we are, uh, it's a model that I think could be and should be somehow followed or at least uh, to think about it. And um, so um, the conference of uh, this year uh, also comes in this uh, logic of the first three years of study in, uh, from Yon Minku. And um, most of you, I think, are students in the first years, um, where somehow during the last, I, I would say, 10 years, 15 years, maybe even more, slowly, um, the projects have coagulated towards uh, uh, acknowledging the beauty and importance of the built heritage, not in terms of uh, museification, but in terms of acknowledging it, the beauty and the importance of uh, the, the existing architecture and also towards um, 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 dwelling and um, houses and um, uh, this important and uh, most simple and mo com most complex uh, function that uh, um, is also um, an instrument to build the city, uh, which is uh, inhabitation. So, these are uh, some thoughts behind the, the invitation uh, uh, of, uh, to, to have here tonight Jonathan Sergison to deliver us, us a lecture. Jonathan, I think uh, we will invite you here on the stage to, to begin. Thank you very much. So, uh, a very good evening. I must say, Stefan, I was enjoying your introduction so much that I was perhaps sitting a bit too comfortably for a while. Um, now I must work. Uh, really, it's, it's a very big deal for me to be here. Um, well, <laughs> yes. Um, but I, I should begin with some words of thanks, and, and firstly to you, Stefan. Uh, we have been communicating now for quite a long time, and I can't believe now is the moment finally when I have the chance to deliver this lecture and to share some thoughts about our work in the company of everyone in the room. I would, <clears throat> I would also add my own words of thanks to the Order of Romanian Architecture. Frankly, an organization I feel I have more 
correspondence with um, the RABA in the UK, which I, uh, I, I stopped being a member of as a form of protest. Um, I should also thank the Jan Minko School. Um, to all of you students in the audience, I'm very, very happy that you're here. And this school for me is one that um, has a, a certain, uh, more than familiarity. Uh, it's it's uh, somehow legendary. Tony Fretton gave a wonderful lecture yesterday. I'm sure many of you were in the audience. He talked of friendship, and it is such a pleasure to be here with someone who is a dear friend, a generous human being, someone who I have found always encouraging, but also demanding. Demanding in terms of the need to find through the work that we make, the architecture, a culture of architecture, and all that that might make. And Tony, I always feel like I underachieve. <laughs> it's uh, it's it, it, the demand that you place in your work is so evident and uh, something that I have aspired to for more years than I would like to count. <clears throat> I first came to Bucharest in 1999 through familiar reasons to some people in the audience. I should add that not only is this audience comprising of old and newer friends, but also my dear family, and this is special. So, Tony, I'm not sure if we were asked to give the same lecture, but Stefan was very clear he wanted me to talk about housing, and I'm always uh, a keen student of what I'm asked to do, so the lecture that I will deliver this evening looks um, exclusively at our endeavors in this uh, area of activity. The issues that we address in our work as architects in practice, and it should be said that this is a long-standing interest, the program of housing. The lecture is organized around a series of themes. They're not mutually exclusive, and to some extent, in some form, every project we undertake addresses them to a greater or a lesser extent. Later, I will explain in more detail in five projects where I will look more in depth at the issues that they explore. But the first theme is mostly housing. While it is the monuments and the institutional buildings that offer a popular image of any city, it is housing that forms the largest built fabric of any urban situation. In other words, cities are made mostly of housing, and the need to accommodate their populations equates to more building activity than any other building program. Typically, housing covers approximately 70% of the land surface of any city, and the right to adequate housing is considered by the UN to be a fundamental human right. While I have spent more or less most of my working life in London for the last 11 or so years, I relocated to this city, the largest city in Switzerland, Zurich, in the German-speaking part of the country. And when Stephen Bates and I set up in office in 96, um, the following year there was a significant change in the polit political landscape of the country. <clears throat> the Labour Party came to power. It was 
from our point of view, a moment of tremendous optimism. <laughs> it feels like nothing changes. Um, after the current government has been in power for 13 years and the damage that it's inflicted. But in 97, this was a moment of, of hope. And one of the first acts of the um, prime minister at the time, Tony Blair, was to establish the position of a mayor of London. And with that um, invitation came the establishment of a department of architecture and urbanism that at the time was led by Richard Rogers. Whatever one might think of Richard Rogers as an architect, I think he could always be considered someone who had a form of political responsibility and he also liked to enable things to happen. He tended to surround himself with younger, gifted people and in the early years of our practice, we were invited to undertake rather large urban studies in London, mostly in the east of London, and here an indication of some of the, the work that we found ourselves doing. This was at a much more urban scale. It demanded of us that we understood more deeply the structure of the city and the needs that it might have in the future. Stefan, in your introduction, I think you almost quoted Roger Dina. He said that a place can be brought to order with the making of a single house. And we've always found that uh, suggestion a rather instructive and helpful one. The character and the quality of a city is invariably in relation to density and the housing typologies and morphologies that have been established over time. I've always liked this photograph by the German artist and photographer Thomas Struth. It's a, a moment in the life of Rome. It seems particularly absent of people and the absence of people places greater emphasis on the buildings. And I find it a very instructive urban lesson in the sense in which the buildings that are documented here are typologically similar, but they aren't the same building repeated again and again. There's a sense of urban decorum recorded in this image. This question of what is a house in the city has concerned me in my teaching activities over all the years that I've been involved in teaching. And since 2008, I've been teaching at the Academy of Architecture in Mendrisio. And in 2017, and then for three years, I set the task of addressing the needs of the city of Zurich, a city that faces a need to create something like, uh, to absorb 100,000 people in the next 25 years. And in each of six semesters, we looked at a different part of Zurich and considered how a form of densification could occur. Because like every city in Switzerland, there is uh, a democratically agreed um, process uh, where cities cannot expand ever outwards, that uh, the need to increase the population has to be a process of densification. So here the work of some of my students, Marta and Francesco in this case, looking at this question of what a future Zurich housing might be. Um, the thing that's such a privilege with working with students is their incredible energy and uh, productivity. And over the course of six semesters, my students collectively made a model of, at a scale of one to a thousand of all of the, the city of Zurich. And e in each semester, they were exploring where the possibilities in the city might be for adding 
and adjusting buildings. Here, a plan that demonstrates the rather precisely the situations in which projects were proposed. And at the end of this six semester process, um, my teaching assistant, Morella, took a photograph of the city of Zurich um, as it is today, and then carefully made an insertion within this image of the result of these six semesters of work and all of the projects. And the point being that the image of the city remains intact, even though a significant number of additional buildings have been inserted into the city. The third theme is economy and governance. Cities hold a vast form of financial capital. And the value of property is invariably in relation to the standing that the city holds in global economic terms. Here, an image of the city of Milan. Forms of speculation, condition development, and the amount of building activity. It follows that the governance and legislation that controls building activity always has financial consequences. Cities are affected by political decisions and significant urban change is subject to democratic approvals. And it follows that projects can be blocked or canceled through forms of opposition. The fourth theme is permanence. I think we all need to be reminded that more building activity has occurred in the period after the Second World War than in the entire history of building that preceded it. Much of the building fabric of the European city is considerably older than its anticipated lifespan when built. Furthermore, building preservation orders and statutory listing protects more of the building fabric of cities, thereby lim limiting the capacity for it to develop within its existing territory. And this theme of permanence is one that I will return to, but here an example of a recently completed project in Belgium, an elderly housing building. More and less, or more and less density. In contemporary terms, the majority of the population of the world live in urban conditions. And this situation is predicted to increase in the coming years. This photographic document, which is undertaken by a, a, a Swiss photographer, records the same place uh, over a series of, of visits, always taking a photograph from the same position. And what you might be able to see in the top image is the arrival of building profiles, which is a particularly Swiss way of checking and sharing information with the population about um, projects that are in the process of being assessed for planning control. In other words, when you see these, you know that a change is coming. But there are also situations where the reversal of a process of densification can happen. This is witnessed in, say, the north of England or in the south of Italy. It is a situation that has existed throughout history. Cities that once flourished in history are now a few traces in a landscape that only concern archaeologists. Housing as types. The German photographers, Benton Hiller Becker, devoted an entire career to taking photographs that recorded buildings and structures that had similar typological conditions. The 
organizing of a typological approach is really a sort of post-enlightenment uh, uh, condition. But when it's applied to buildings, um, then it becomes an issue that is of interest to architects. This is a type that's very familiar to me, the London Terraced House. Um, arguably, I would say, the UK's <clears throat> greatest architectural invention, a way of organizing the expansion of the city of London in the 19th, uh, the 18th and then the 19th century, although it's not an entirely original uh, type in as much as it adapted uh, an idea of a house from the, the Netherlands. The result of making city with this repeat, repeated uh, housing solution is a rather low density urbanism formed of streets, squares, and on rare occasions, crescents and circles. And while this housing solution evolved in a particular manner, um, it is one that uh, remains fascinating, certainly, to uh, Stephen Bates and I. The possibility of dealing with our own relationship to it came through a competition for a small social housing project that we won at, in 1999 to create a new building at the end of this uh, Victorian Georgian-style terrace in uh, North uh, northeast London. The thing about the, terrace, the London terraced house is it was always happy to be um, uh, a, a, a solution of one house being added to another. It was never very adequate at finding a solution to the end of a terrace. And in the case of this project, it was one of the questions that we found ourselves addressing. On another occasion, another terraced housing exploration here in a, a street in the east end of London, uh, a street that is more... Um, uh, disparate or um, heterogeneous in its urban character. But it became clear at the end of the 19th century that it wasn't possible to create um, the uh, a housing that would need to absorb the growing population of the city of London and it required um, the invention of a new solution uh, looking to continental Europe for inspiration. And what emerged at the end of the 19th century was uh, a flatted form of housing and what in English is called the mansion block. Here, a fantastic example of this by Richard Shaw in, uh, near the Royal Albert Hall. And Stefan, you already mentioned this project in your introduction, but this is uh, our own attempt to uh, reinterpret the mansion block as a housing type. Between the 1920s and the 1930s in the UK, something like three million of these houses were built. For me, it's the housing solution that I equate to the suburban fabric of, of all um, cities in the UK, the semi-detached house. And this photograph is for you, Stefan. Um, <laughs> you see it's not exactly black, it's more like dark brown and light gray. This was the first um, collection of families that uh, occupied these houses. But it was, a, it was a project where we were really trying to reinterpret the qualities that we witnessed in this older housing solution. And more recently, an example of exploring further the, the double house, uh, this project in the south of England. Over the years, the longer I've spent in continental Europe, the more I have grown to appreciate the perimeter block within in a courtyard as an urbanizing solution. Um, Zurich is not alone in uh, 
exploring this as an urbanizing concept. What's particular in the case of Zurich is often the, the middle of blocks have small buildings that in the past were, um, were places of um, employment. This is a recent project, one that appears on uh, the poster, uh, a, a small courtyard block where our task was to um, uh, introduce housing within the middle of an existing uh, perimeter block in South London. And finally, in terms of a, a typological ex exploration, when one thinks of a legacy of international modernism, the, the, the tower as a solution very much comes to mind. Um, in our own work, it's one that we've explored rather tentatively here, a project in, in the west of London, uh, a project which we're currently building in uh, Leuven in Belgium. Arguably, this would have been the first theme of any lecture. Um, from the outset, it has been, it is a question, a complex question that we've attempted to address in our work. Uh, this is more recently uh, an attempt to understand our own responsibility to uh, the impact that building places on the environment. But when we understand that building creates something like 40% of the CO2 emissions, uh, our work as architects is certainly not innocent. And questions of how we can most meaningfully limit the impact that our activities have on the climate and on the environment is something that we give careful consideration to. In our earliest projects, we gave priority to timber forms of construction. But another fascination that has existed really from the beginning is also the theme of reuse, the possibility always to try and extend the life of an existing building before it's demolished and something is built to a higher density. And all of the embodied energy that that older structure might have will be, will be sacrificed. But inevitably, this, this theme has a relationship to construction. And I must say, I rather enjoy this photograph. Um, uh, the building of housing in the UK. I've always found it a little bit misleading to talk about the building industry because there's nothing that I can see in this photograph that talks about precision and process. Uh, building feels very, very low tech and uh, the act of building is subject to uh, small part, bits of carelessness and imprecision. I think there's also though a relationship in terms of construction to the emotional character of the choices that we make through what we build things from. International modernism explored certain freedoms in construction which still remain today. But in very many ways this has become the default form of contemporary vernacular, the in situ concrete slab and column structure. Uh, this is one of our projects um, from the early uh, 2000s. But it must be added that unlike in Bucharest, London doesn't have the seismic difficulties that um, would create an even greater burden on the amount of cement that's used in the structure. The eighth theme is old and new. And here I feel a small debt to Tony. He pointed out at, in a conversation not very long ago that 
every building at the point that it's realized is a contemporary building, that, that the cities are a condition of adding to and adjusting, but they're also the holders of their own complex histories. And I like this photograph. It's, it's taken of a rather typical street in, in Zurich, but it, it talks rather um, carefully about this relationship of the differing versions of contemporality that exist in this, in this image. This is a photograph Stephen took when we were working on a project that I'll explain in a little, a little bit more detail later. But what I like about it is it, it is like the earlier Thomas Struth photograph, another document of a form of urban decorum, that every building at the time that it was made was a contemporary building. But the manner in which more recent buildings have added to this place in the city of Geneva is done with a, a sort of a double sense of exploring their own relationship to contemporality, but at the same time showing a form of respect for what preceded. And this is a project that I will return to later on, um, uh, an apartment building uh, in uh, an inner city site in Geneva. Again, mentioning Roger Dina. When I look at this plan, what I see is an incredible discipline, a way of working out how to make the best version of a housing. But more than that, a demand on the organization of a plan which is self-imposed, that the arrangement of this collection of spaces clearly has an idea about the way that apartments can be organized. And it, to me, every square centimeter of the planning of this apartment building, of Artec building in Basel, seems like it's done with great demand and accuracy. I'm not sure we're so careful. <laughs> this is a competition entry we made for a, a, a site in, in Zurich where we were exploring the perimeter block and uh, a, a, a certain looser uh, arrangements of plan were uh, part of that exploration. And again, this project in, in North London, in Hampstead, um, uh, anecdotally, uh, the history of that project was that it was begun in the Zurich office at a time when we didn't have very much work. And Michal Stettler and I explored some massing proposals for this site in North London with a great deal of fun and certain freedom. Uh, and the London office uh, then picked the project up and the the, the formal freedoms that we were exploring were then uh, extended through this uh, ambition to create a series of rooms, each with its unique character and a rather fanatical avoidance of the corridor as um, an organizing element. It's not always possible to avoid a corridor. Image and, image and representation, it's really unavoidable in our work as architects that we can um, not project an image into the buildings that we work with. I really like this photograph, although on previous occasions when I've used it in a lecture, someone came up to me afterwards and said they didn't know this project by Sodis and Bates Architects. Um, I really wish we had designed it. But the thing that's extraordinary about it is that if you hold your eye up and, and cover one of the two houses and then reverse that process, your understanding of scale is completely distorted. It's, um, it's really fascinating. And a lot of the time, one can find discrete acts of carefulness and beautiful compositional qualities that come out of need and circumstance. Here, a rather ordinary house in Ticino. 
And this, this work of questioning what the image of an architecture is, is one that continues to fascinate us, both in practice, but also our work as teachers. And here, the drawings of Matt Bailey, a former student working in this case on a project for the city of Naples. And when we worked on this double house uh, in the late 90s, 1990s, what we were consciously trying to do was to create an image of a house or two houses that had an almost childlike character, that it had something of the most clear image of a house. And as was already commented earlier, in the case of this project, it was about our own relationship to this older London housing solution, the London terraced house. <clears throat> the space between is very much a theme of fascination, the character of the European city where one in, on occasion encounters proximity and a form of density that comes out of uh, need and circumstances. This is an image of the same, photo, uh, same project I referred to earlier in, in Basel, the Vartek building, where the very conscious um, setting out of uh, the urban form creates this, this sense of the right space between. And this project that I will show in, the, in a moment in a little bit more detail in North London, what we were de deliberately trying to resist is a tendency in contemporary urbanism where buildings have to be a polite distance one from the other, and yet what we encounter in the inner cities of European um, urban conditions is a, a fantastic sense of closeness. This topic is complex and ever-evolving. In the past, it was perhaps easier to anticipate who might occupy the apartments and the homes that we might plan. This set of photographs by the English photographer Tom Hunter documents the rooms of an apartment building in the East End of London before they're demolished. I think, they, for me, this, these photographs hold many lessons, but it strongly reminds me that the decisions that we take as architects quickly become rather secondary to the decisions that the residents of housing um, introduce, the making of a home. And wherever possible, we like to uh, document our, our work when it's inhabited. Here, the same apartment building in, in Geneva, and I know two people in the audience will know who I'm referring to when I name David Grandorch as the author of this photograph. David managed to persuade all 19 uh, apartment residents to open their door to allow him to photograph their apartments. I don't think I'd open the door if David knocked on it. He's <laughs> rather brutish looking but has a very soft voice. But what's, what's revealing is that the placement of furniture is never as you imagine it when you, when you um, are working on a project. And some additional themes beyond the 12 that I've already listed. The making of corners as a task in architecture. Here the work of Kai Fisker when he was only 26 years old. He made this fantastic um, perimeter block in Copenhagen. A project that we're currently working on for a, a, a new block in uh, the east of Switzerland where Amongst many other things, the corner is a theme that we're addressing. 
the organization of the program on the ground floor, another theme, or the way that the top, the top of the building is organized. And of course, the Medici Palace is an exceptional example of such a task. But also the work of Gardella in Alessandria is inspiring and was certainly um, a point of interest when we were working on this project in North London. Tony, is this still your favorite house in London? Yes, yes, so Robert Adams um, house here in the west, of, west end of London. I always like the decision it takes about the position of the door, which is not symmetrical to the arrangement of the facade, but it is in the middle of the street. And in the work of Caccia Dominioni, often a fascination with this moment of entry where a door is a rather compressed moment in the architecture of his housing, and in this instance, uh, even sunken into the ground. The organization of circulation in housing, the need to anticipate modification and changing service, servicing requirements, um, there is something really fascinating about this drawing, and I must say it's not made by our office, but one of the, the consultant um, planners on a housing project I'll show you in a, in a moment. And it is a thing of absolute wonder how, how the care in which the, the cabling of um, the servicing um, is, is arranged. Perhaps the theme of thresholds and entries. So at this point, I'll talk about a project that I've already shown some aspects of it. Um, a competition that we won in around 2000 uh, to make uh, how, uh, social housing for a housing association in London. It was a competition. Um, and we proposed three buildings which uh, have this rather wonderful relationship to a, a London park. I must add, it's not always uh, so busy. It, in orange, you can see the situation of uh, the project and this outlook. But it, our work began as a sort of more typological investigation here, a, a sequence of models that were exploring different questions, the geometry of the roof, the position of the entrances, and eventually uh, beyond the sort of formal um, shaping of the volumes, the dis distribution of window openings. Later on, what emerged at another scale of model making was an interest in creating a series of horizontal registers and here a model that shows the three buildings and in their completed form. And this much bigger model was trying to explore more precisely the disposition of the openings and a drawing such as this, it's an unwrapped elevation that's exploring how, how for example, windows that are close to a corner create tension or when they're placed further away from the corner, it can create a greater sense of solidity. And that theme of permanence is perhaps underlined in, in the choices that we made about the construction. It, it, this project was worked on at a point where a lot of our work had been exploring timber forms of construction. And we said to ourselves, it is legitimate to build in a way that feels heavier and as a result, it feels like the, the weightiness of the choices of the construction can give a greater sense of stability or permanence. Here drawings that talk about the, uh, the organization of the construction. And here a drawing that uh, in plan explores the disposition of uh, the furniture, the need to test how house, um, the, the residents could furnish uh, the, the apartments uh, later on. The point being that 
I can't imagine what we drew was ever uh, how exactly people furnish their apartments. Here a plan that's somehow more about the architectural organization of the spaces. We were slightly taken aback when this project was completed. It was published in the Architects' Journal and the writer, who's not the dumbest person, asked the question, do you find this housing scary? <laughs> I'm not sure what to make of that. Returning to this project in Geneva, a competition that we won um, in 2004 for the city of Geneva. The project, as you can see already, is mostly housing, but it also has on the ground first and second floor um, a, a more public program, a crash and a community center for the, the, res the kids and the residents of the, the wider neighborhood. We worked on this competition at a point where we had been very invested in trying to develop uh, a, an understanding of housing mostly situated in London and one of the things that was quite unusual for a Swiss competition is that it didn't define precisely how many apartments of what size and what mix. All of the, the, the competitors were free to, to propose um, a solution to what they thought was the best fit. And I remember Stephen and I uh, talking with Jean-Paul Jacot, who we collaborated with, and saying, finally, we have the chance to make really nice big apartments, not these kind of incredibly tight ones that we're used to making in, in London. And to our absolute happiness, we won the competition and the city architect told us later that one of the reasons that we won the competition is that we proposed twice as many apartments as all of our uh, Swiss competitors. And I think there's a lesson there that, you know, um, there are, there are things that you can learn from coming from a tough place. The project attempts to reconcile the two characters of the buildings that it sits um, between a 19th century school building, and on the other side, uh, a, a, a commercial complex from the 1960s by Marc Sergé. Geneva from the 1950s onwards has developed this highly refined uh, precast concrete industry, uh, one that we were really happy to to, to work with and develop. Here you can see examples of um, the, the, the Koresh program as part of this project. This photograph again, which was a, a reference to the way that we organize the circulation to the building with this open staircase, which you can see also in the plan, although unlike the older example that we were drawing uh, inspiration from, we also, of course, had a lift. And here again, that photograph of David. And in the development of uh, the tectonic character of the facades, what we were keen to do was to explore a kind of finish to the, to the, the precast concrete elements that would have something of a, a similarity to the stone of the older buildings in the, in the neighborhood. This model helped us sort of figure out how to put it together, but making it as a precast building was logical in this inner city site where we were working so that um, the elements of a facade could be uh, craned in and the building volume established quickly. And if you look very carefully, the elements of a facade are comprised of M shapes and T shapes that come together. Uh, 
And this is also perhaps a, a lesson in what you can do in some places and you can't do in others. I don't know that I would ever uh, <laughs> propose such incredibly exacting precast concrete work in the UK, but in Switzerland the joints are all to the highest level of tolerance. Another example of social housing here in the city of Vienna, a competition that we won with a Viennese architect, Werner Neuth, and the Zurich office of von Barmos Krucker. And I remember when we started working on the competition, we had a meeting in London, and as we were three offices, it made sense to develop three buildings what each office looking at one in with more responsibility but in that first meeting there was also an agreement about a set of principles that our work would explore a set of themes one being that each building would have a, a step back at the top another theme that they would explore squarish forms but that they would also look at um, introducing chamfered corners and another theme that we agreed is that it was more interesting to place the entrances to the three buildings in the center of um, the collection of buildings rather than at the perimeter, a, a gesture towards collectivity and communality. This was a model that we also made at the time of the competition and this image. But we were excited by this theme again about the space between, the sense of proximity that these buildings might offer. And in our, the building that we were more um, responsible for, here the facades explored as a series of vertical registers with small adjustments and corrections. And on the corner, a rather grand entrance. And I remember this was one of the few things that the Housing Association took issue with. They said that it was somehow too bourgeois to organize the entrance of a social housing project with such a, a generous uh, kind of scale. And we said that it's quite the opposite, that it was a, an act of um, generosity that we felt was completely fitting, that uh, the residents of this building returning from the work that they might do would feel happy when they, they come home. In 2015, we won this competition on a, uh, a site uh, in the north of Zurich. Uh, a site that had two smaller buildings on it and the owners of the two sites got together and organized a competition which we won. And I show this project perhaps in terms of the sense that there are so many competitions that we do <laughs> endlessly and the expectation should always be to be rather measured with um, in your hope that you might win, but also that the ideas that you can develop with certain freedoms in competitions can be referred to. And in this case, the competition that we did um, in the east of Switzerland, the plans that we then uh, developed, while they're particular to the situation, also look at similar themes or interests in their arrangement. In other words, I think it's, it's important to say that uh, the speculation of a competition can allow for the development of ideas that it is completely uh, uh, fitting to return to on another occasion. We made this model um, when we did the competition. We knew that we had to present the project to the jury 
And this model is really rather big. <laughs> and it was a bit naughty to, to make a model, but it was uh, to show them uh, what it was that we were interested in exploring. And again, it's a, it's a project that explores this same theme of the space between. This is one of the, the key ideas that we were interested in at the beginning, and these sketches are looking at that and, and perhaps other issues about uh, the facades and the way that they're organized. In, in Zurich, there is a particular urban code that allows for a, an extra floor, the attic floor, as long as it doesn't occupy the entire length of the facade. So you can see in these elevations that um, there is an additional volume here, but um, that it can't be along the length of, of a facade. Uh, something, again, that the model was helping us explore. Here, the completed project and this space between. And at the top of the staircase of one of the two buildings, there is this turned skylight, which again is an example of um, the incredible commitment to carefulness that um, the building industry in, in Switzerland affords. Here the entrance to one of the two houses, and perhaps of uh, this point that I was making earlier about the, the lessons of the work of Caccia Dominioni, this, the moment of compression when you arrive at the front door of a house. And finally, uh, this project in Antwerp, on the other side of the water uh, from the two towers that Tony Fretton was showing in his lecture yesterday. A competition that we won with two other offices, um, the office of Dirk Summers, Bovenbau, and Bolk Architects in Antwerp. And our competition entry proposed uh, a, a perimeter block and one that rather um, deliberately explored the differences uh, that come from this, this form of collaboration, the sense that it, um, it, it like the older uh, blocks in, in Antwerp, it is um, made through uh, a series of smaller acts rather than a uni unifying whole. It must be said we always feel slightly at home in Belgium. There is uh, a wonderful brick industry that uh, we've enjoyed learning from and comparing to our experience of uh, the culture of brickwork that we know from the UK. It must be said, in Belgium it is much more precise. And it's possible to do special things. And still this interest in the search for a form of generosity in housing, the moment of entrance as a place of orientation. Okay, that's the last image. Um, and the technician repeatedly told me, when I get to this image, I have to go to that one. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jonathan, for the very beautiful lecture. Um, now I would like to say, um, we, are, uh, we arrived at the moment of a uh, question and answer. Um, um, so we, you are invited to, to ask questions to, to Jonathan. Meanwhile, um, we ask uh, the people, the technicians of, the, of this uh, venue to <coughs> install the the table and the, the armchairs for the debate that is to follow uh, with uh, Tony Fretton and Jonathan Sergison. 
Um, да, окей. Okay. So, um, uh, please, if you have any questions, so we have a, a Wi-Fi microphone that is going around the, the hall. Uh, just please raise uh, the hand. I know uh, the first two, three questions uh, are trickier than everybody could, uh, could ask something. So, in the meantime, uh, I'm going to pass the microphone to Radu and uh, so that he can ask a question and then uh, please uh, ask, uh, raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Thank you, uh, Stefan, for uh, your beautiful lecture. I, I just have one question. Uh, you said um, that in the case of uh, Zurich, densification is maybe the only available instrument uh, for the city to respond to certain necessities to accumulate more people, more and more people. And uh, relating to your study, your recent studies and that of Julia Scotos um, uh, and her uh, recently presentation about new typologies of dwellings that are replacing existing ones yeah. in, in the case of Zurich, uh, showing that these new interventions don't, don't necessarily bring significant more housing units which they uh, were meant to do. Um, in this context, what is your opinion about um, the theme of reuse, which you stated here? Could this type of project be able to deliver better results in the Zurich case, or maybe in the broader sense? This uh, is my... Radu, thank you. Um, I feel really guilty at this point. I, I said to Stefan earlier in the day, maybe ask Radu to ask a question as a way of... <laughs> so thank you for having the courage and uh, making such a, a, a careful question. I mean, to give a bit more context, so uh, as I mentioned, this, this work over six semesters then led to um, a, a research project being su submitted to the Swiss National Fund, which I did in collaboration with Tom Avermatter, who's a uh, chair of uh, the history of theory of urbanism at ETH and also Irina Davidovich who has an extensive experience of housing and Julia Scotto is a postdoc who is working on this research project there are two uh, doctoral students as well and um, I think that the question that you're asking is is really embedded in in this this overall project, but also the research that um, one of the doctoral students is asking. Um, I must say, when we started our work in 2017 with the students in Mendrisio, we observed this rather urgent and, and quite pragmatic approach to how to densify Zurich, and it led to demolition and rebuilding to a greater density as um, the easiest way, let's say, of, of solving it without taking full responsibility for the environmental impact that this has. And I looked to the audience and there are lots of younger faces and really, you know, what I feel your careers will face is all of the kind of wonderful fascination that comes from reuse as a program. But, you know, cities are not constantly rebuilt. And I think the city of the future exists. And the task that we have is in relation to maintenance and every opportunity to extend the life of buildings. And that's complicated, but it's also fascinating as a theme. Um, you're, you're right to remind me in, in my lecture that I was talking about the interests that we've had in reuse. And I must say, it was only one project that really illustrates this, but I think there's a, another lecture entirely where I could show the many, many examples of, of reuse. So I'm nearly 60, um, and I feel like the chance to build a new building is perhaps a result of the opportunity that my life has afforded, but it's not innocent. You know, the, the, the opportunity of building is one that comes with 
great responsibility. And I, I'm sure that's what Julia was addressing in her talk in Delft. The, these, this questioning of how much can we afford to carry on demolishing, these are easy solutions. And I think we have to be much, much more careful. It's been really wonderful spending the last few days in, in this city, a city where every time I revisit it, I can see more of the older fabric of the city has been carefully restored. And I hope that this will become uh, a more urgent task in the way that all of the kind of wonderful work of your predecessors can be um, extended. Thank you. Yes. Are there any other questions? Please uh, raise your hand. Meantime, Irina. So, as uh, I read uh, the interview that uh, you gave for the Matsokyo magazine a lot of times, <laughs> um, <laughs> which I loved, by the way, it's very, very interesting, both of them. Uh, something stuck with me, and I would like you to maybe comment on, uh, I will cite to you the part that I loved, and I would like you to maybe uh, talk about it a little bit, because it addresses the part when you were starting the office, Sergison Bates, and uh, as you said, there are a lot of young architects and students here, and I think it's, it's an interesting part, part to talk about. So you said, when I look at those early projects, I see how we invested we were in developing a position as architects, a way of articulating our ambitions. I look at them now with great fondness, but I must admit I was fantastically inefficient, although very necessary. Can you please tell us, did you lose this inefficiency uh, growing older, let's say? or how, how things evolved? Well, thank you for reminding me of <laughs> those words. But I, I, perhaps to try and give account of, of what it was that I was saying, you know, the, the, the first building you make, you have to learn everything. You don't know how to set out a brick wall. You don't know how to deal with tolerances. You don't know how to coordinate the services. I mean, everything. It's really exciting. But it, I mean, it's also not just, you know, the technical demands that are placed upon the work. There's also uh, other ambitions that you're exploring in relation to your architectural interests. Um, and with building, comes lessons. You, you learn from the act of building and from that you can, if you're open to a form of reflection and self-criticism, things can adjust in the future. But what I think I was reminding myself of when that conversation was recorded is that, you know, Stephen and I started working by sitting opposite each other at a table and debating, but it's probably arguing uh, <laughs> endlessly about what it was that we were trying to do. And we would draw as a way of sharing an idea. Um, but it was, I look back now, a very, very necessary time. The investment of, of discussion, I, I think, was, was necessary, but Later, it doesn't feel so efficient. I mean, you, you, you've already worked out how to uh, set out a brick wall. Um, maybe you could find another way of doing it, but um, I think with time, experience helps you find other areas of, it, of interest and learning. Um, yeah, but I, I, I still remember fondly those, those first projects and the way that we organized they're making and of course you look back on them now and you see things that you would sort of perceive as mistakes not in terms of technical failure but just the kind of um, stuff that's the result of not knowing very much 
Thank you. Are there uh, questions in the room or uh, should we proceed to uh, the talk? So uh, I will invite uh, on stage uh, Tony Fretton and Jonathan. And So this is uh, this is the last part of uh, of our uh, edition of Matsokyo. Um, this is uh, something we thought of uh, having a, like an informal debate, of course, on stage. Um, and I wanted to to propose a small talk uh, in with uh, two questions for uh, each of uh, our our guests. Uh, the first question uh, would be in this context, so please uh, bear with me to, uh, <laughs> to draw the context. Uh, so, I'm thinking that all building should, uh, should uh, construct a place, uh, be local, be finite, but in the meantime, uh, all project uh, of architecture should, uh, should add to the general debate of architecture and should have uh, uh, a meaning and uh, well, a message. I'm not particularly fond with the, the word message, but it, it should have something to say uh, about our profession. And um, it's like a moral, like a moral need to contribute to the culture of our discipline. Um, so I would like to address uh, two of the founding principles in your architecture. Uh, which I think uh, resonate to each other. So uh, in, the, in, the, in your words, Tony, uh, you talk about architecture as collective activity. Um, and uh, Jonathan, I would like uh, with you to address the idea of tolerance. Uh, for me, these, uh, these ideas uh, are somehow related. So I'd like to begin uh, uh, addressing uh, the question to Tony. And, uh, um, I would like uh, to give a, a short quotation. Um, you, you said that uh, designing, constructing and establishing meaning in buildings are collective activities. And um, I, I particularly liked uh, uh, the, the, the words you begin with in your uh, uh, um, book, important book, um, uh, about building and their territories. And uh, you, you, you say, and th this I really uh, find very nourishing as, as idea, that building and their territories is a phrase that compresses a large number of ideas and techniques in our work. Buildings hold a wealth of social and constructional knowledge for us, while territory is both the physical area in which our buildings have a positive effect and the field of ideas with which they engage. So, my question, after uh, this introduction, um, ah, Tony stole, my, stole me. Uh, the, the, um, the paper. So, <laughs> my, my question would be this. So, you conceptually open the, the, the interior of the project, the interiority of the project to the alterity, to the, to the collective realm. So, I was wondering how can uh, how can you control uh, uh, the the making of the project while um, you know being open to towards the others? Uh, well, um, I have to say that I, I'm quite deaf, and the acoustics of the room mean that I only heard about a tenth of the question. But in a way, that's not uninteresting if you're surrealistic, um, which I perhaps I am. Um, your question was how can you control architecture while making it open to uh, interpretation by other people? Yes, and I also wanted to address the, the notion of strategy and detail in that regard. He's sitting right next to me, I can't hear a word. Ah, it's okay. really bizarre. Sorry. 
It, okay, tell me again. So I wanted to address the notion of strategy and detail. Okay, well, you, it, to uh, attempt to make a piece of architecture that may be open to interpretation by other people uh, requires, uh, uh, let's say, intuitive knowledge. And the way that one does it, I think, is by recognizing conventional behavior of people and oneself and accommodating that in a building. I, I remember being at the Villa Rotonda by, um, uh, by Palladio and I, I wondered at its plan and what I saw was in the basement of the building which always mystified me, you know, why would there be a Sockler? In the, the Sockler was a space for a means of transport, a space for cooking, and a space for storage. And in, in the Villa Rotonda basement, there was a, parked inside it was a Fiat 500, a Pog and Pog kitchen, and a whole load of food. So what Palladio understood was very repetitive um, uh, human things, you know, cooking, going somewhere. And I think if you can grasp some of that, but also if you can be, stop being a, too much of an architect and stop insisting that your uh, architecture is going to do something, if you can just wonder how somebody else might use your space in the way that Jonathan remarked. If you can do that, and if you can make opportunities, like when you put the windows so that people can put a couch under it, if you can forget architectural formality and respond to what you think people might do in your spaces, then you, you're some way into making an architecture that other people may feel comfortable to use in the way that they want. But in terms of style, then the next question would be, I mean, uh, the first answer I've made is how people would uh, utilize the space, you know, how they would put furniture in it. The second question is, how would they f uh, allow, what, how would that building give the means for them to own it in their imaginations to operate their own fantasies there. And that's more difficult. And that's where architectural imagery is important. Um, and at a certain point, you, you can't, I can't really explain more than saying that you, you look at buildings that exist and you wonder how people see them and then with that wonder, you make the buildings that you make. But on top of all of that, of course, you make a piece of architecture which has formal precision and is architecture. It's not simply a piece of building. So uh, that may go some way to say how one might make a, a building that's reinterpretable by other people, both in terms of their physical use of it and their imaginative occupation of it. And uh, can I uh, add to the question, so does this um, uh, going towards the others um, also is a part of constructing the project while making the project? Does that al also happen? Do you mean thinking about how it's built or when you say constructing, you mean designing it? Designing it, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, you, l I, when you look at lots of buildings. And in fact, if there's any advice to give here, it would be that uh, just look at everything. It doesn't have to be good architecture. Look at buildings. Sometimes I find um, very interesting and casual compositional modes in a building that is quite bad, you know, quite um, innocently bad, let's say. So one looks at, you look at buildings which have been done by people of different talents and different intentions. And often you can find in a, 
a built form, so to speak, something where you, as an architect, you can recognize uh, pleasure, the pleasure that somebody else may take of it, but also something startling, you know, something which verges on the banal or the boring or the shocking, um, which turns out to have some usefulness. That's next question. <laughs> so I will uh, pass now uh, to addressing the notion of tolerance, which um, somehow for me also uh, brings to mind this opening of the project. And uh, you have written uh, two important texts uh, about tolerance, uh, working with tolerance and more tolerance uh, quite a while ago. And, um, you know, um, I, I, I thought, you know, it's a word, tolerance, that uh, has a lot of meaning. And uh, especially here in Romania, um, working as an architect and uh, dealing with the uh, constructions and with the, the, all the process of building, everything is very relative and uh, you have to improvise a lot, especially at the scale of a small office, of mm -hmm. course. Um, so, uh, uh, discovering this, uh, this beautiful concept of tolerance, you know, is like uh, an extended hand uh, on a theoretical level. So, uh, my question would address um, um, somehow what you what the, the, the notion of tolerance uh, is a critique towards so um, <coughs> um, so uh, working with tolerance uh, it is my understanding that it's, it's something that rather enables things uh, rather than dictates them it's uh, it's not imposing things it's um, uh, extended bridges uh, from one thing to, uh, to the other um, it's uh, sometimes when the exterior of a building is not identical with the interior of a building. So the section is something very interesting to look at in that, uh, in that uh, realm. And uh, somehow my question is going to, to this final uh, task of, uh, of asking you if, you know, there's this ideal in modernity where the building should be one single idea. It's one, you know, one technique, one one single thought put into, into, into the project. And the, the, the idea of tolerance, as I, anyway, my mind discovered it, uh, somehow challenges, and uh, challenges this uh, uh, rigor which is somehow uh, ob compulsory to, the, to some part of contemporary architecture anyway. So I would like if you could comment on and explain us more about, uh, about um, Tolerance. Well, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, it, it's a, a, a theme and a, a notion that we found very helpful when we were beginning to try and articulate a position as architects. I think we we enjoyed the sense in which, just as you state, Stefan, tolerance can mean many things. I mean, we we examined it in terms of its helpfulness in relation to construction but the, the sense of tolerance wasn't about capitulating any form of responsibility or um, denying the the role that architecture can have in terms of making decisions it was it, so the the theme of tolerance wasn't wasn't something that interested it as in terms of um, an acceptance of any any condition, but in relation con to construction, it was it was something that still um, I think is at the core of our practice. That you know we we now have this experience of, of of building in so many different European building cultures, and the first thing you need to work out is how it's possible to build in such a situation that what we would dare to do in one building culture isn't immediately transferable to another as i was i was as i was implying for example uh, the work that we're doing in, in in belgium is often drawing upon brick forms of construction and what we really like about brick construction is firstly no two bricks are ever the same 
And there is a, a, a wonderful ability to set out bricks because it's a small element which can allow for a, a wall to sort of absorb the, the, the inefficiency of, say, a setting out. Um, you know, brick construction, we think, is, is tolerant in the purest definition of the word. Um, concrete isn't, uh, for example. Uh, but there's, there's, there's something else that I, I, I'd like to pick up on, which I think is in relation to what Tony was, was talking about. And it's the fascination with the lessons that the things that exist in cities has. You know, I, 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 your interest as an architect are obviously always evolving. The things that fascinate me now are not the same things that I was interested in when I was in my 20s. Um, I think my own relationship to modernism is, is a shifting one. And I think my own relationship to history more, more widely is shifting. You know, I remember when I was in my second year going to Italy and being shown Palladio's work, and I knew it was important, but I didn't know why. It, it took a long time. And I think there's also a, another thing that I, I would always say to my students, which is, don't imagine you can invent anything that hasn't been done before. I think, you know, if you, what's wonderful when you start drawing upon cities as a place that can be instructive, you realize that in some form, anything that you might call an idea has uh, uh, been explored by someone else, whether it's high architecture or just a very pragmatic solution to a set of circumstances. So that's an attempt to answer that question, but I feel like I need to reread those two essays now. I think that uh, the, the s part of the subtext of the question was also regarding, uh, I think you formulated somewhere that you can both work with precision and imprecision in the, in the meantime, mm -hmm. in the same time. And um, now this is very interesting to have a strategy for the project that allows you to to integrate and to 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 bring poetry uh, while uh, touching the goals of the project. But I, I really like what you were referring to earlier. That sense that when you compose a facade, it it doesn't need to come out of uh, the structure of a plan. It, it's a, it's a different task. You know, you look at much older examples of architecture and this, this sense of um, the role of the composition of a facade plays is, is, is a different, say, concern to the, to the complete fiction that modernism at times put forward, which was about honesty. And, you know, you talk about the possibility of making buildings in this sort of very demanding and very singular way and for me that's not very interesting because I, I look at the older history of architecture and honesty was never, a, whatever yes. that might mean, a, a consideration of architects say working in the Renaissance time. It was other, other issues that were, were more important. Yes, I, I wanted to touch also on this concept of modesty, of uh, honesty in architecture, and uh, I wanted to ask you, Tony, what 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 do you do you make of this? Uh, um oh, well, I think that that idea is not helpful. I think we architecture is or making a building is is about compromises and fitting together uh, things that don't really want to fit together. Um, and that's its pleasure, you know, it's a series of important directions which have to be fitted together. So I, I, this idea of honesty is, doesn't help, I think. I wanted to say um, that you can learn a really a lot about a place. Having, having worked in, in um, other countries and wondering how you could work in that place, um, you can learn a lot by looking at the buildings of the place in which you 
are. It, they tell a lot about the attitudes and value systems. And today we had a, I had a very wonderful um, uh, tour with uh, Christy and Radu and uh, Stefania of um, Bucharest and the sort of tumultuous history, recent history of Bucharest is absolutely evident in the buildings. And what struck me about the, the people that gave me that tour was um, their openness to all of those types of architecture. You know, I suppose after the fall of communism, there was a rejection of what had gone before, but but also I hear um, a a recuperation of what was good sometimes and positive in that period. And I think it, I, the final thing today was to see two buildings by RDN, which were fantastically elegant and actually represented a, a moment of confident contemporaneity in, in Bucharest architecture. And what also was very interesting was how, as I hear it, that the work that Jonathan and I did innocently, you know, against the grain, turned out to have some uh, value to people like RDN who taken it and moved on in a different way with it. That's fantastically rewarding. It means that instead of the work that you have done being simply a personal thing. It means that it has some utility in the broader scope of architecture. So that, I mean, I, I'd say, just talking to people today and looking at, at the situation in Bucharest, I think you're in a very interesting moment. And uh, contemporary architecture of significance occurs in unexpected ways. When Jonathan and I were looking at uh, Herzog and Dumeron and Roger Dina's work in the 90s, of course Switzerland had a very significant uh, architectural history, but suddenly buildings were being produced there uh, which affected everybody. And the same thing in Porto where, I mean, you know, what was Porto, but suddenly Caesar appeared with things to say. So there's no written rules here. There's also a curiously un, not easy to understand set of uh, conditions, a kind of alchemy which makes this type of unusual architecture occur. In Ireland, for example, now there are four or five fantastically good world-class architects, you know, from not from nowhere, but from unexpectedly from somewhere. And I sense that possibility here in, in Romania. You know, I, I can see it. If you've seen a lot of architecture and you thought a lot, you have an instinct for this. And so that is something, I mean, we could come here and talk endlessly about what we've done, but it's more rewarding, as rewarding, to talk about what what's being achieved here and to support it and show friendship for us, for it. Um, and that brings us to the second part of my planned uh, debate. Um, and I would like to address you a more generic question. We were talking the other day about uh, technical schools and um, uh, the universities of architecture in Switzerland. And we were talking about how important um, uh, the people who, who, who uh, finish, who um, obtain the degree from the technical schools are for the, for the practice, practices in Switzerland. And uh, the generic question, uh, and uh, maybe too big question, uh, I would like uh, to maybe to, uh, to instigate you to, to, to choose sides. Um, you know, uh, we are here with our students, and uh, I was wondering, which school would you prefer? The one that first uh, uh, teaches students technical abilities, and then once they have uh, gained this, uh, this masterful uh, possibility, possibility of uh, 
of knowing what architecture is made of, then they could uh, go into the world and see and understand the typologies and the history of architecture and then produce new one? Or would you, would you be the advocate of uh, the other uh, possibility where stu the students should the first uh, uh, open their eyes without having uh, this uh, narrow path in front of them you know, of uh, how to do things and maybe have uh, the imagination uh, free and what, what say you? I think it's a difficult question to answer. Um, I mean, I, I would say too much freedom is never a great thing. Um, I, I think Tony and I have different experiences. I, I studied in two schools of architecture in Canterbury, which was an art school, um, and then finished my studies at the AA. And I finished without knowing anything about construction. Um, I, uh, and this isn't, this isn't good. I, I, it, it, because I think you need, you need to know how to construct if you're ambitious with what you want to do as an architect. I don't think, I don't think it's good enough just to say someone else can take care of that, that side of it. You know, the, the, the art of architecture is about building, I would argue, and so I think you have to profoundly know how to, how to build. And what I was, I think, referring to was an experience of uh, say the, the, the Swiss education system, which in so many ways I think is very pragmatic, that not everyone is interested in design, but a lot of people are very interested in construction, and the, the schools are organized in, a, I think, a very efficient way where um, ETH and EPFL, where I know you studied, and, and Mendrisio give more emphasis on, say, the culture of architecture rather than the craft and the technique of it. And Fachhochschulers take care of a, a more vocational uh, training where um, their students are uh, studying and working in offices at the same time. And they have a profoundly rigorous training and they certainly know how to build. And offices benefit immensely from those skills. <laughs> But there are other skills that architects need as well. I think, I, you know, what I think I was saying is that um, the best combination is to have both educations, I, uh, which I didn't have. I, it, I think I, I suffered in my time after school where there was this sort of existential crisis about feeling insecure about not knowing how to build, and that was somehow inadequate. And I think eventually, you know, the more demanding you are on, on what you want to do as an architect, the more necessary it is to know how to build it because otherwise you're not really able to be at the table and sort of say, I know this, is, this makes sense. Yeah. Can I um, talk about that too? Um, I have taught for the last 10 years in the London Metropolitan School and I, I'm frustrated with the way that construction is taught. And it's taught by friends of mine, good friends, but there isn't a rigorous construction course all the way through. My view is that a student of architecture should emerge into offices with a knowledge of construction that's even better than the offices that they go to. So they should, academia should provide advanced training in construction, and I, I think there's a way to do this. I, about a year ago, I did some uh, critiques and teaching online in Cork in Ireland, and it was for first year. The students were given a very beautiful site, a very simple manageable project, not too small, and a number of construction techniques. And they, they understood that relationship between those parts. And we now in the office have hired recently two graduates from the Irish schools. And a consciousness of construction is deeply embedded in their attitude to architecture, which it isn't with British graduates. They're, they're robbed of this. 
Uh, so that's that's and that's my disappointment, I might say. And I think it's you know it's a sweeping generalisation, but you know the difficulty I have with the education of architects generally in the Anglo-Saxon world and particularly in North America is there is this huge divide between the few sort of critical, whatever that really means, uh, say conceptually ambitious practices that have no work and rely on teaching and then practice more generally which is very, very commercial and practice has to be commercial but not the form of practice that I'm describing, which is really about um, a form of service rather than something that is more ambitious. So I, I see that very, very negatively. I think it's, it, it, considering the, the resources of this huge country, it's kind of lamentable how, how poor architecture is in the States. Yeah. Um, yes, I was thinking that uh, here in Bucharest, uh, it's the university lasts six years, and the time uh, doesn't seem enough for uh, for students and for teachers to to go all through all these steps. And the students really work. I mean, uh, everybody knows that here. So um, sometimes, as a teacher, you you feel the need to to choose sides somehow. But I'd, I'd like to say something about that. Please. You know that um, the wonderful thing is that you, you don't stop learning the day that you leave an architecture school. Maybe you begin learning at that moment. You just have enough to begin to make sense of what it is that you're, you're trying to do. I mean, for me, one of the great privileges is this life of teaching and practice and what I learn from the students just reveals quietly that teaching is slightly selfish. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that you're exposed to the ideas of the students in a way that you have to make sense of and you learn from figuring that out. I mean, I'm always much more interested in students that bring things to my attention that I hadn't thought of myself. This is really a kind of wonderful aspect of teaching. But there's also a very large deficit in most schools of architecture where I've taught, which is um, a discussion about how you make money, how you control expenditure, how you, what work you can get, how you get work, how work is commissioned, all of that which people are, have to learn at the moment, they learn outside the university and that's really wrong because they, it takes four or five years for them to discover these things and that really slows their career down. Yes, but uh, <laughs> I'm thinking that uh, a healthy relationship between uh, academia and uh, the practices in a country, in a place, uh, is something desirable. And um, of course uh, in Switzerland, where we look a lot in uh, Yon Minku, uh, this connection, this uh, very, uh, very uh, intimate connection between academia and the practices is fantastic. There's an, a huge number of offices who participate in the architectural competitions, which is a very common practice. We st we're starting these days in Romania also. It's a, an important fight of the order of architects to, to, to be able to provide that. Um, and then so there, there isn't a rupture, there isn't a breaking point between academia and the practice. Um, in Romania it's not that obvious, I would say, in, in a general term, or in a general landscape. So um, I think that, the, as, as Jonathan said, I, I also agree that um, uh, the education just starts with the university and um, the offices should uh, take responsibility after the university, somehow. But it, it, it really makes me happy to hear that there is this demand on the competition system because if you look rather analytically at, at, at any architectural culture, you know, having a, having a competition system is, is absolutely essential. But, uh, and in my experience, that needs to be done in quite a pragmatic way. But, you know, it's not very helpful always for a big 
complex task to have an open competition because the worst thing is a really young office might win but not have the skills or experience to, to realize it. But the open competition is still absolutely necessary as a way of uh, giving the chance to a young office to start their career. And, and if I speak about my experience with, with Stephen, that we were lucky enough to win one or two competitions when there still were competitions in the UK. Um, I think the, the combination of both possibilities is really good. But I think the, the health, the architectural health of, of, of a country, the competition is one factor. I think the schools are another, and I also think journals are an important one. And I really thank you for the efforts that you're doing to, to, to communicate the culture of architecture through your efforts. It's really remarkable. And Tony, we sort of failed at doing that in the past. We, you mentioned that in the lecture last night, but um, I think this is again something that is, is really, really wonderful to, to, to give space for people to write and um, debate architecture. Can I, I, my experience of competitions, in my experience of competitions, the, the most efficient and effective one was the Flemish system uh, and it starts with there being what's called a, a Reichsbaumeister, a government chief architect and the Reichsbaumeister has an office and the office has a small team and they invite all projects, all people considering making a project or municipalities to submit details of the competition of the project to them then they rewrite the competition into a, a tiny A4 page with some photographs and then invite submissions from people showing their relevant experience and then a, a shortlist is made and those people compete and it's only at that point that they have to do any design work so one of the big problems with competitions is the amount of money that's spent by offices losing competitions. And the Baumeister system is very good for that because you start to have a method of presenting your, uh, let's say, your portfolio of experience. And so it's very, very simple to make these applications. And mm -hmm. so a competition system that considers the effect on architects is very, very important. But Tony, another factor is architects being on juries, and you know that, that this is absolutely essential. That the architect has to be part of the, the discussion and and help the other members of a jury to understand the qualities of, of one project that. Um, might be uh, more successful than another. But when the architect is not respected and certainly not um, uh, significantly involved in the jury, that's a really bad situation. Um, I think we uh, have arrived to the end of our uh, okay. debate. Uh, if you have, uh, you would like to say something more? Um, I would just like to say it has been wonderful to share the experience of being with you all this evening. It's been wonderful to be in Bucharest again. I have enjoyed being physically back in this city. I know recently I've, I've taken, taken part of events online. Um, uh, it, 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 it's always an education whenever I come back. So thank I sincerely thank you for this occasion and, and really all your kindness. Thank um, you. And not only you, Stefan, it's a, it, it, it's a small team. Yes, thank you very much, Jonathan Sergison. Thank you very much, Tony Fretton. And thank you all, and hopefully we'll meet uh, next autumn with uh, our previous, our future uh, plan, which we will uh, communicate shortly. <laughs>